Welcome to another episode of Room for Thought. I'm Douglas Carswell, and joining me this week is Matt Ridley. Matt is one of the uh, foremost science writers, a best-selling author. You've sold over a million copies of various books. You are a member of the House of Lords, and also, if I can put it this way, one of Britain's leading liberal thinkers. Thank you for coming along and joining us. Well, I don't think of myself as a leading liberal thinker, but I, I like to throw rocks in ponds and see, see where the ripples go. Talking of one particular deep and murky pond, the House of Lords, you're a member of that. Um, what's it like being a Brexit-supporting member of the House of Lords? You're surrounded not just by Remainers, but actually some pretty hardcore establishment Remainers, former diplomats and all, all, all those types. Yes, I, I, it, it can be a bit lonely at times. Uh, you, it's hard to remember that the majority of the public is on your side because we are outnumbered about five or six to one, I should think, in the House of Lords. I mean, it's that bad. So Much the, worse than the House of Commons. The, there have been some actual votes where pretty much 80% of the House of Lords in effect voted against leaving the European Union. Something like that. Yes, exactly. Right. Uh, and uh, At every opportunity. And uh, uh, I, I called it in a speech this gilded crimson echo chamber of Remain, which got a, a headline <laughs> in the Daily Mail, so I was quite pleased with that, but uh, it got a laugh. Uh, the great thing about the hustle is on the whole, people are polite to each other, so one can have a bit of fun while uh, um, being uh, a lonely voice in favour of Brexit. Uh, but there is, there's a group of extremely committed and uh, talented Brexiteers, people like Michael Forsyth, mm -hmm. and, uh, Nick True and so on, and, and we, we occasionally make a point and win a point. But it's pushing water uphill. And there was a moment actually just a couple of months ago when uh, I'd been speaking for about five minutes and Lord Adonis got up and accused me of filibustering. The unelected Lord Adonis. The unelected he, Lord he, Adonis. He, he tried to get elected a few weeks that, ago that, and failed. That's right. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, he had been uh, slowing down every statutory instrument that came to get us ready for Brexit by talking for hours about the details of why it hadn't been gone through particular procedures, etc., for months. And, uh, you know, holding votes in the middle of the night to shut down debate and things like that. Now, if that's not the definition of filibustering, what is? I mean, he's spoken something like 1,500 times, and I've spoken something like 40 times in the last year. So there's a degree of hypocrisy on the other side of the argument. Were you a bit surprised? at the extent to which some of these unelected figures are prepared to actually try and reverse the referendum results and stop it? Well, I think it is very striking, this phenomenon, uh, and it changed in 2017. In, in the first year after the referendum, uh, a, a lot of Remainers said, well, we've got to get on and make the best of it. Um, but then after that general election, uh, when the Conservatives lost their majority, uh, I think it did change. And a lot of people started saying, no, hang on a minute, we could actually stop this. We so you think there was, a, in a sense, a vacuum, May's weakness, or rather yeah. government weakness, and yeah. into that has come a bit of Remain resolution? And, you know, remember, these poor people, they, they swim in a very small sea. They, you know, most of them don't go to the north of England like I do. <laughs> They meet ordinary um, people when they order a Deliveroo or, or pick exactly. up the dry cleaning. You know, they genuinely yeah. get the impression, because we're all uh, subject to the availability heuristic, which is yeah. that, you know, you, you, you get the impression from your surroundings as yeah. to what the world is like. Uh, and if you don't leave London or the southeast of England much, and you don't leave um, bien pensant educated society, uh, then you get the impression, well, hang on, everybody's against Brexit. You know, I haven't met. And her. if you only what, listen what to BBC Radio, famously said, "I've never met anyone who voted yeah. for Nixon," you know, or whatever. You know, it was, it's yeah. that sort of mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, I, I suspect if you only ever listened to BBC Radio Four, you would imagine that overwhelmingly the case for um, Remain was was solid, and the Leavers were irrational and emotional, which is rather why we're doing doing room for but thought. Of course, it does give us Leavers one advantage, which mm -hmm. is that we constantly hear their arguments, so we polish our responses. Mm -hmm. They sometimes haven't even heard our arguments. <laughs> I don't know. Um, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, do you think we're going to leave? Do you think we'll leave at the end of October? Uh, I think that Britain has to leave. I think it's very hard to imagine any future in which we don't leave after mm -hmm. the last uh, three or four years um, uh, in some form. Um, but uh, I, my faith in that view has been somewhat shaken by the uh, failure to leave on the 29th of March, mm -hmm. Uh, and the uh, extraordinary determination of uh, Theresa May to push her rather odd deal uh, as the only way of leaving, which has messed things up really quite badly, I think. 
Um, uh, personally, I think we should leave whatever happens on the 31st of October. We did huge preparations for no deal departure uh, running up to the end of March. We passed hundreds of statutory instruments to make sure that uh, all our laws were in a good shape. Uh, we shot down one after another all the stories about what might go wrong, mm -hmm. you know, that aeroplanes wouldn't be able to land, all that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, all we're faced with is whether or not there is spiteful stuff about uh, trade that happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've heard very clearly from the head of Calais that he doesn't want to lose business to Zeebrugger, yeah. so he wants to keep things flowing, etc., cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, So I'm, I'm personally convinced that if we did walk out without a deal, uh, without a withdrawal treaty, uh, on the 31st of October, it would be a relative damp squib. Yes, things would go wrong, and yes, it would be painful, and yes, it would lead to a hostile view of us from Brussels, which would be in the long term a problem that we'd have to deal with and, and get right. But I think in the short term, it would surprise on the upside. That that cheers me up a lot and um, brings me on to my, my next um, point, which is about... I don't know why I'm telling you this. You know more about this than I do. You're, no, no, you're, 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 I'm, I'm asking the question. You're the only Brexit Party MP. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that no, was the other lot, wasn't uh, it? The precursor, the straw in the wind. That's right. Quite a storm. Um, changing tax slightly, optimism. You've, you've famously written a, a best-selling book, The Rational Optimist, and what you have to say about um, Brexit cheers me up. But you, you talk about optimism in, the, in, in a sort of broader sense, nothing to do with the day-to-day -day nitty gritty of British politics or indeed politics anywhere in the Western world at the moment. But you, you argue that actually, if you take a step back and look at the world today, it's a great time to be alive. And whatever we think about politicians and Brexit and whatever we think about American presidents and all the rest of it, actually the world is getting better. We're better off than our grandparents and our grandchildren will be better off than we are. Talk, talk me through a bit about that. Why, why do you think that the world is better now than it was 30 or 40 years ago? Yeah, well, my motivation to write that book partly came from my experience as a young person in the 70s when I was told that the future was grim. I was told the population explosion was unstoppable, that famine was inevitable, we were going to run out of food, the desert was advancing, the rainforest was disappearing, the, my sperm counts were falling, you know, all this stuff. And, and I believed every word of it. And frankly, I don't remember the grown-ups telling me anything positive about the future at that time. Literally. I don't remember anybody saying, hang on a minute, we might be very rich in the year 2000 and the world might be a really quite a nice place to live compared the to today. The world's vastly better than the 70s in terms of... Exactly. You know. So I was genuinely, you know, when it turned out okay, not just okay, but much better, this collapse in global poverty, the end of the Soviet Union, uh, no famine, uh, you know, we've actually defeated famine except where politicians cause it. That's another point. But um, uh, extraordinary improvements in, in child mortality, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is the greatest measure of misery anybody can think of. So I kind of felt a bit of a, well, hang on, I want younger people to know that we were wrong before and we might be wrong this time when we're saying depressing things about the future. And there is this tendency always to be gloomy about the future. And the most striking statistic is the number of people living in extreme poverty. It's down to below 10% of the world population. When I was born, it was probably 60%. Mm -hmm. That's an unbelievable change. No one has ever lived through that uh, in their lifetimes. And most people don't know about it. I mean, if you are, most people think it's going up, the, the percentage it, of the world. Is this say most extreme. people? I mean, I, I have a very different background. I grew up in Uganda in the 1970s, Central Africa. Yep. And I was out there recently, and there seems much more optimism because within living memory, people can remember what they call the bad old days. Um, you know, growing up in Uganda in the 1980s, in the north, there was famine. Yep. There were nasty wars. Today, Ordinary Ugandans not only have enough food, not only have a, a, a life expectancy fast catching up with our own, mm. but many of them will now have a, a mobile phone in their pocket or a smartphone that gives them more computing power than NASA had the year they landed a man on the moon. And, and because that's happened so suddenly, people are aware of it. I just wonder if in the West, where people take 2% growth per year for granted, we don't quite understand the scale of the improvement that's happened around the world. I think that's exactly right and it's particularly acute since the 
big great financial crisis of 10 years ago because we've had sluggish growth and we, we, we looked over the abyss and thought we might have reached the turning point and everything was going to start getting worse at that point. And we haven't quite got that mentality out of our heads. And actually, if you look at these polls, people like Hans Rosling do, and you say to people, here are three options. The percentage of the world population that lives in extreme poverty has doubled, halved or stayed the same in the last uh, 20 years, which is true. 65% of people in Britain and America say it's doubled, and 5% say it's halved. And by the way, if you ask a chimpanzee, it answers 33%, because you know you <laughs> write the answer on it. So, so chimpanzees are six yeah. times as better, as, as good as people at answering that question. But if you ask Chinese people that question, on the whole, they get it right. They know that the percentage of the world population that lives in extreme poverty has, has gone down. Yeah. But my optimism, just to get back to your first question, isn't so much just the trend line, you know, what's been happening and how we don't appreciate it. It's why it's been happening. And the reason why it's been happening is because we find ways of working for each other and that raises each other's living standards. And in the process, we innovate, we produce new products and services that improve each other's lives. And on the whole, if you find a way of improving other people's lives, you can sell it and make a living out of it, and other people can sell what they've discovered and make a living out of that. Uh, and if you discover a way of making someone's life worse, then you've got to work pretty hard to make sure that it sells, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> if you see what I mean. The, so on the whole, the drift of technology, of innovation, of, of culture has to be towards improvement. And it's quite hard to stop it. And having that sort of highly, what you might call sort of hyper-specialised economy, once it was pretty much just a few people in Northwestern Europe, the Dutch and the English and then the Americans, you could almost say that within our lifetime, the, the real change is that what was once just something for Europeans, it's now become a global phenomenon. Highly specialised economies That's around the world. absolutely true. And when I was writing The Rational Optimist in, in around the year 2009, which was a brave year to write a, a book about optimism because the world economy was teetering on the brink of, of collapse in, in 2009, if you remember. But anyway, when I was writing it, um, uh, the, uh, uh, quite a lot of people were still saying, yes, Asia has had a, a miracle. But Africa can't possibly have a miracle. Look at the great stats for many, Ethiopia. There are, exactly. <laughs> there are too many people. Uh, ne you know, when they haven't got the infrastructure. They, they haven't got the culture. You know. And I wrote in this book, no, no, even in Africa, we're going to see these improvements. Changing tax slightly, as, as we become richer, you know, a society that gets a certain standard of living stops simply wanting the basics and you start to be prepared to spend more on your children's education, you start to invest more in healthcare. I wonder if we've now reached a point where we're so prosperous that actually we want to preserve and invest in the environment in a way that would have been unimaginable previously. And that far from being a sort of um, a fad of the eco left, the whole idea of conservation is about to get this massive boost because we, we, we can, for the first time, set aside bits of the natural landscape parts of the sea, we, we don't need to harvest natural resources the way we did because yeah. we've become so productive. I, I'm fascinated. Talk me, th talk me through how... Well, there's a fascinating phenomenon whereby if you take, for example, deforestation, mm -hmm. poor countries deforest uh, rapidly, rich countries don't at the moment. In fact, they reforest. Spain, and, I think, is a very good example of this. Yes, right. But, but even countries like Bangladesh are now increasing forest cover. Oh, really? Because they've passed the point at which the, 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 the GDP per capita of about $4,600 a year is the point at which countries stop deforesting and start reforesting. And the world as a whole has now just about passed that point. The deforestation rate has dropped to, the net deforestation rate has dropped to pretty well zero. So the key yeah, is to so make sure that poorer countries get rich quick. If you get, make poorer countries get rich quick, they stop cutting down forests. Now, why is this? It's partly because people no longer have to go into the woods to cut, to cut firewood to cook over because yeah. they've got electricity or gas or something to cook over. So, you know, a lot of the reason was the switch to fossil fuels, which meant that we didn't have to cut down forests. So when people demonize fossil fuels, you need to remember that. Haiti is 98% deforested. Next door, the Dominican Republic is, has got excellent forests. Why? Because it subsidizes propane as a cooking fuel so that people won't go and cut down trees to, to burn in the wood. So that's one example. Another way to think about it, to put it clearly, is that uh, wolves are increasing, lions are decreasing, and tigers are holding their own at the moment. Um, 
Why is that? Because wolves live in rich countries, lions live in poor countries, and tigers live in middle-income countries. <laughs> it's that simple. Now, it's partly because we decouple society from nature and we don't need to exploit nature. You don't need, people don't live off bushmeat and firewood. Um, but it's also partly um, because, as you say, we just get space in our lives to care about this, to mind about clean air, to mind about beautiful landscapes and things like that. And so you're absolutely right that, that conservation uh, of natural resources is a, a luxury we can afford as we get rich and that the interest people show in it is a great sign. But it's the fruit of prosperity. It's not prosperity that's the problem. Mm. And yet we still talk in this very sort of 1970s way as if it's, oh my God, the richer we get, the more resources we're going to use. That's just not true. I mean, you often hear David Attenborough say, infinite growth in a finite world is impossible. Actually, that's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is this very simple point, that some growth is not an increase in the use of resources, it's a decrease in the use of resources. Less land to produce more food, or less energy, or something like that. You know, smaller devices. And you know, that the growth can be shrinking. To, con to connect with the previous point, if the human capacity for innovation and invention is infinite, you can make the resources you have go further and further and further and further. Right, because let's say you've reached the point where you think there is no more growth possible in the world, and I come along and say, well, actually, uh, I've invented a battery that's half the size. Mm. That's growth. That's improvement. Mm. You know, you can do that in, ad infinitum. The, the real problem is getting environmentalists to think in terms of agents other than the state doing things. Because mm -hmm. the state makes a hell of a mess of this This, stuff, is, this is where I wonder if Michael Gove, given what he's been doing as a minister, after we've left the European Union, given the fact that there will be some form of subsidies for the agricultural sector, I think, I think he could be incredibly creative if he wanted to create an incentive system. I'm not in favour of subsidies, but you could create an incentive system um, where you know, you're, you're, you're rewarding right. good behaviour. And so a very good example of this is um, uh, that at the moment we have something called agricultural property relief. That is to say, if you own land and you farm it, you don't pay inheritance tax on it when you die. Mm -hmm. So that's a big incentive to keep farming it and not to rewild it. <laughs> well, if you changed it to conservation property relief, saying, uh, actually, if you improve the uh, biodiversity on this piece of land, then you don't pay inheritance tax mm -hmm. on it when you die, um, then you're, you're not increasing the cost to the taxpayer uh, at all because uh, it was going to get agricultural property, now it's going to get something else. But you just tweak the incentive mm -hmm. and you drive lots of private owners to do things rather than saying, oh, no, this must only be done by the World Wildlife Fund or the RSPB yeah. in cahoots with Natural England. You know, it's terribly top down the way everybody thinks about the, about the environment at the moment. People just don't think in terms of experiment and uh, trial and error and bottom up approaches yeah. and different ways of doing things. Um, if I could move on to a subject to, to bring it, draw things to a close, um, climate change. Um, there's a, 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 a huge um, push at the moment politically for the government to, to do something about climate change. And I know the government would argue that they're actually doing quite a lot to cut carbon emissions. But I, I just wanted to ask a, a couple of questions about this. I mean, for a start, the term climate change, I'm right in thinking that the climate is in a constant state of flux. There have been periods in global history when the climate was a good deal colder than now mm -hmm. and periods when it was a good deal warmer. And by definition, it couldn't have been human activity that caused that. Is, right. is that right? Yes. I mean, 20,000 years ago, we were in the uh, maximum state of an ice age. And we, were, uh, we weren't under a mile of ice here, but in Northumberland, I would have been under a mile mm -hmm. of ice. Uh, and um, uh, that, the height of the ice age was a very nasty time because it wasn't just cold. Uh, it was also uh, very low uh, carbon dioxide in the air. So plants really struggled to grow. So you couldn't invent agriculture because there was just not enough growth rate of plants and things like that. Um, uh, as a result, there were large dust storms uh, because large parts of the continent couldn't support vegetation. So there are huge deposits of dust in Antarctic ice from that time. And it was a very volatile time. It was a very dry time. You know, Africa was basically pretty desiccated. It's a pretty horrible place compared to very small forests. You know, tropical rainforests were very much shrunken. 
So that's, uh, you know, that's where we've come from. We warmed up very suddenly out of that into an interglacial. The northern ice sheets collapsed uh, all over Scandinavia and Eurasia and so on. Uh, and we came into a much wetter, much warmer, much more stable period when we in, were able to invent agriculture. Warm and wet being good for plant Warm growth. and wet being good for, and, and higher CO2 levels being good for plant growth as well. Uh, so this is all part of the same pattern. And we've then been co cooling slowly since. But there was a sudden dip into quite cold conditions called the Little Ice Age a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, we're now warming quite rapidly out of that. Now, I'm prepared to accept that the, cu that the current rate of warming is exacerbated or possibly even completely explained by human CO2 emissions, because CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Um, but the idea that we're heading for imminent catastrophe or that we're already seeing those kind of disastrous situations is simply wrong. And it's not what the scientific consensus says. So the, the activist consensus has moved a long way from what the scientists say. Mm -hmm. I mean, they say extreme weather's uh, getting dramatically worse already. Simply not true. You know, tropical storms, droughts and floods, there is no trend towards them getting worse. I, I imagine quite a lot of it is um, we now have rolling 24-hour news and smartphones. Exactly. So when there is a hurricane in Florida, um, you can see images of it. Well, we see images of it, but we also survive it better. The death rate due to droughts, floods and storms is dramatically down, probably about 90% down since the early part of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's with a, with a higher population. Um, cool. And that's because, we, as you say, we've got better shelter, better communication, better transport and so on. So, so we are adapting to climate change. Climate will continue to change. We do need mm -hmm. to do something about CO2 emissions to stop them going uh, up uh, fast. And the, but the way to do that is not to run around picking technologies and rewarding people with huge subsidy bungs to put up useless wind turbines that are mm. utterly unreliable, or worse still, to build to burn wood in power stations in Yorkshire that has been cut down from a forest in North America, destroying the habitat of wildlife, and which produces more carbon dioxide than burning coal would do. I mean, it's just yeah. unbelievable how barking some of our policies are. Um, um, and so what, what we need to do is, is come up with a, you know, call it a carbon tax or whatever, and link it to what's happening in the climate and say, look, if the climate is getting worse, then the carbon tax goes up. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. And, mm -hmm. and, let's, and use it as a general incentive to drive technologies that will either produce energy without carbon dioxide or we'll capture carbon dioxide from the air. We don't know which is going to be better and cheaper. But energy is crucial to our civilization. And we, you know, we make it expensive at our peril. We destroy jobs if I've, we do that. I bought a little toy the other day with my daughter in Poundland, and it had a, a little solar panel in it. And I, I thought to myself, it's quite extraordinary that solar paneling should be so cheap that it's something you yeah. attach to a, a child's toy. Presumably, it's that sort of invention, yeah. um, you know, solar paneling, not yeah. just on roofs, but in windows, in yeah. cars. But also just think about LED lighting. You know, uh, I mean, uh, if 20 years ago, we had incandescent bulbs, and then the governments came along and said, we've got to get rid of them and have complex fluorescent bulbs. Well, they were not very good. They didn't switch on very fast. They were very difficult to dispose of. They were much more expensive. Were these are the ones we're, that took a while to yeah, light we had, we had to force them on the public. Mm. Well, if we'd waited a couple of years, LEDs were coming along, which are far more energy efficient, produce extremely nice light, um, uh, and can be switched on. And they're everywhere now. I mean, traffic lights. They're everywhere. Traffic exactly. lights now. So, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why you're using le less electricity. But it's interesting. Another, another thing that happened about 10 years ago, the government, or 20 years ago, the government decided that actually to preserve the environment, they were going to get us all into diesel cars. Yes. We now know that diesel is actually well, really nasty. Let, you know, we shouldn't let the environmentalists forget this. They campaigned very hard for diesel because diesel has less CO2 emissions for uh, the same amount of uh, energy, but it has more nasty other kinds particulates. of emissions, yeah. particulates and nitrous oxides. Yeah. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, that, that policy was pushed in cahoots with the German car industry, which is very good at making diesels, by the way. It's extraordinary that corporate lobbying, big automobile interests, and the so-called environmental lobby all on the same side. It's, 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 it's Why, the, why is that extraordinary? It happens all the time. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, we've now got big wind, which is almost as big. I mean, it's, it's a gigantic yeah. user of subsidy, and it's a very powerful influence behind the scene. 
And, you know, the, the BBC's co coverage of uh, climate change is almost always uh, exactly what the wind industry wants to hear. Thank you so much for coming nice in. Talk. And Douglas, it's, it's really good to talk. It's been really and, great to have you. Um, thank Wonderful. you. Thank